article in Wall Street Journal. They're talking about the next spring counteroffensive. How do you see the U.S. policy on this? Well, I think this is uh, more a question of not being willing to admit outright defeat. They, they can't very well just walk away uh, from the Ukraine and, and declare that, well, too bad, it didn't work, goodbye, we're, we're going home. Uh, that would be just far too embarrassing. So instead, what they're talking about is some kind of a peace process where the Ukraine uh, is willing to give up territory in return for joining NATO. What, of course, they're talking about is um, the Ukraine being dismembered and uh, some part of it being given to Russia, since Russia is about to take it anyway. But stopping Russia from taking all of it, and in return, what the Ukraine gets is NATO occupation. It basically becomes uh, an American colony, like um, um, the, the model that they keep talking about is Korea, where uh, the Ukraine becomes like South Korea. Um, and uh, Russia has already said that this must be some kind of a joke, uh, that it has already taken uh, some of the territory it wants. It's going to take the rest of the territory that it wants. It's not going to ask anyone's permission. It's winning the conflict. And what the Americans want is um, not really even a topic for discussion. They're not part of the picture. Now, as far as uh, arming the Ukrainians for the next mighty onslaught on the Russian lines come next spring, well, those are just words, you know. Uh, why, why should we think that that would be any more successful than the last time? What reason do we have to think that, you know, this is anything at all other than uh, making, you know, a brave face and, and you know, uh, when, when facing defeat? Uh, so I don't think that, you know, this adds up to a lot. Um, I think it, it's what it's showing rather conclusively is that the Ukrainians no longer matter. They no longer have a voice. If if Washington can declare that you're going to give up your territory in return for some consolation prize, and the Ukrainians pretty much, um, you know, raise a stink domestically in 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 the government media in the Ukraine itself, but that doesn't amount to anything at all. That's just noise, and you know that that's just. Uh, for everyone to laugh at and ignore. But in reality, what it tells everyone is that the Ukrainians will pretty much do as they're told. And uh, if they're told to basically vacate the territory that Russia wants, the Ukrainians will vacate that territory. Whether they'll get anything in return, probably nothing. They'll probably be cheated again. So that's pretty much where it stands. You mentioned this loss of Ukrainian in this counteroffensive. Just the Polish president Duda had an interview with Washington Post. He said that right now Russians, Russian imperialism can be stopped cheaply because American soldiers don't die. This is a very sad statement, isn't it? Well, uh, the, the Poles are kind of in a strange state. They have to keep making that Polish mouth music that they always make about the great powerful resurgent Poland. But the thing is that they tried to lay a claim to Western Ukraine and they got slapped by both Russia and Washington simultaneously from two sides. And they pretty much shut up about it. So what the polls say is just basically, again, it's, it, it's equivalent to what the Ukrainians say. It's for internal consumption. This is not, they're not a force to be reckoned with. You know, it seems that there is some conflict between Poles and Ukrainians on the grain, on the grain deal, on the, I mean, these grains from Ukraine. What, what's the problem there between them? It's a problem that came from this exhaustion of war, or is it something else? Uh, the grain uh, problem specifically has to do with the fact that 
uh, the Ukrainians made a deal with Monsanto and Archer Daniels Midland and uh, other um, Franken food companies that make inedible grain. Uh, and they have planted this grain and you know it's it's forbidden in Europe, it's forbidden in Russia uh, and they were able to make inroads in in the Ukraine. And uh, now the Ukraine has been, inundating uh, Eastern Europe with this uh, low-grade toxic grain uh, that is being sold very cheaply, squeezing out quality producers in, in Eastern Europe, uh, bankrupting the farmers there, and is basically causing a giant scandal because uh, the, 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 the farmers there are a political force that the, the local governments have to actually pay attention to if they don't want tons of manure delivered to their to their front door by tractor. And um, so this, this is a problem that they're trying to deal with. Um, on the one hand, this grain is about all that the Ukraine has left to, to pay for the supplies that it needs because it no longer produces anything for its own consumption. Everything has to be imported. And on the other hand, what it has on offer is, is not what Europe is willing to accept. In general, what, what the Europeans are realizing is that the Ukraine is completely useless in any capacity whatsoever. The people are useless. The country itself is useless. It's all just a waste. And the message is slowly sinking in. We know that it's been five months that Russia is on defensive. How do you see the public opinion in Russia? Are they forcing this administration to go on offensive? Or is this administration going on offensive soon? Well, first of all, it's not the Russian culture to second guess central command. Uh, the Russians understand that this is a war. And uh, in a war, you do not question your orders. And uh, that is very much ingrained in Russian culture. So uh, the the Russians who do question their orders are basically not treated seriously. Uh, the, they are disregarded. And there are very few of them. They're basically being being looked at as somewhat abnormal. They're, they're, they're looked at as psychological cases, not political cases. And And in general, the Russians are very... Uh, cautious in terms of volunteering to to send people to their death for the sake of what um, everything is going pretty much according to plan as far as as, as far as Russia is concerned. Um, of course, the the uh, Ukrainians could retreat faster, but that's not really necessary. Uh, the, the whole idea is uh, the Russians are very uh, comfortable behind uh, three defensive lines that are, as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, completely impenetrable. They're very comfortable in, in figuring out what it, what it is that NATO has and how to counteract it and how to make armaments, new armaments, such as drones, uh, that, that they can sell. Uh, to anyone who then will want to or will be forced to pick a fight with NATO. Um, and, um, you know, the, the army show that just uh, um, took place near Moscow was very well attended from people throughout the world. And they, uh, they signed orders for a lot of Russian equipment, a lot of it new, newly developed, such, such as attack drones. And uh, things are going well as far as Russia is concerned. This war is not hurting the Russian economy. It is helping the Russian economy. Uh, Russia has returned to economic growth. And, and so there's just nothing wrong. There's nothing to complain about. And the, the fact is that, you know, uh, the, the Europeans and NATO are throwing everything they have at, at the Ukraine, and they're being restrained and, and being depleted with um, a really minimum 
of, of effort and of casualties. Uh, so that's nothing to complain about. We know that U.S. is forcing Egypt to send weapons to Ukraine. And for for the U.S., it's, it's a zero-sum game. You are with us or against us. There is nothing in the middle. You cannot say that we are... We don't care about anything is happening, that we, we want to have good relations with everybody. And do you think that if they insist on this on these policies, we're going to have some changes like in Pakistan? I don't know. I, I don't think it matters that much. Um, you know, Egypt sending its, uh, its Russian-made weapons to the Ukraine where they'll get destroyed means new equipment orders for the Russian defense industry. So that's a positive. Um, I don't think that this is going to ruin the relationship between Russia and Egypt by any means. Uh, I think it's more going to be a, a test for, for the strength of the uh, U.S.-Egypt relationship. Um, and I think I don't think there uh, the U.S. has much of a choice. Perhaps Egypt doesn't have much of a choice either. And that is the uh, the key difference between how the Americans deal with the world and how the Russians deal with the world. The Russians do not have your either with us or against us mentality. Basically, everybody is good for something, and uh, every, you know nobody can be relied on for anything that's critical for Russia. You know, Russia has uh, uh, two allies: its army and its navy, as the saying goes. So it's not like the Russians are going to be be terribly upset if e Egypt helps uh, uh, helps the Ukraine. Uh, it certainly hasn't ruined the relationship with Turkey that the, Tur the Turks have been um, arming the Ukraine rather ineffectually with, with their Bayraktar drones. Um, so that's just uh, par for the course. It's, it's nothing. Nothing special, I would say. How do you see the role of Turkey? Because it seems to me they're sending weapons to Ukraine, they're sending drones to Ukraine, helping Ukrainian government. On the other hand, they're trying to have negotiations with Russia. They're playing in the middle. Oh, their policy is very simple. What's uh, what's good for Turkey is is what they do. They they uh, they only care about themselves, and uh, that is explained by the fact that they're Turks. Russia has a very long history with Turkey, and right now uh, the level of accommodation, that, that mutual accommodation that they have worked out is really quite good. Uh, so from the Russian point of view, uh, basically uh, it's there is no question that there's going to be quite a lot of backstabbing coming from the Turkish side. The question is, how much backstabbing can can Russia tolerate? And so far, the level of backstabbing that it's been getting from Turkey is uh, lower than the historical average. So Russia must be relatively happy with that. The Minister of Defense of Burkina Faso was in Russia. What's the message behind this visit? What would be the can, the outcome of this reinforcement in, in the relations of Africa, these African countries and Russia? Well, it's a replay. You know, Ru Russia, or the Soviet Union, was instrumental in liberating these countries from colonialism. Of course, uh, after the Soviet Union faded away, starting with Gorbachev pretty much abandoning its internationalist policies, um, it, it eventually... Uh, Africa and other countries eventually lapsed into a sort of neo-colonialism. Um, so did Russia for a little while. Uh, the Ukraine is still very much the, vic the victim of it, basically being exploited, uh, not through direct uh, administrative control. That was uh, basically hand handed over, excuse me, handed over to various hand-picked semi-puppets, but definitely full-on uh, colonization as far as uh, 
finances and, and economics, uh, where these countries' uh, resources were being exploited, but the people were kept very poor and none of the money filtered through to actual economic development. So Russia is again stepping in its, into its role, uh, although uh, with a rather different mindset where it actually wants its fair share for the effort that it's, it's going to expend. It's not going to be a freebie, but it's the best deal that the Africans and people in Latin America as well are going to get. So they're going for it. So it's goodbye, France. Hello, Russia. Where does Russia stand on what's going on in Pakistan with Imran Khan? Well, I, I think that uh, there's a, a quite a bit of sadness. Uh, Imran Khan was a, was going to be a good friend to Russia. He he made a show of establishing good, friendly relations, and that's why the Americans uh, went after him and basically threw him out of office by fomenting street demonstrations. And uh, the Russians really don't have very much control over Pakistani pol politics. They, they're they kind of late to the game. They never had much influence there. They're, they have to be very careful because they, they have to, to please New Delhi, which is a far more important uh, partner. But on the other hand, they, they can't let Pakistan wander away because of the north-south transport corridor, which is in the works, which of course is something that the Americans and the British are going to do everything in their power to, to prevent. And, and so it's a difficult uh, situation and uh, um, whatever is happening there, there's really no public discussion. So there's probably some preparation and some uh, low-key uh, diplomacy taking place, but I don't know what it is. The Chinese companies accounted for 31% of African infrastructures contracts. And on the other side, the U.S. has 12%. And we, we see this investment of Chinese in Africa, this new alliance with Russia, with Wagner Group. Are we going to have a new confrontation between the U.S. on one side and, and Russia and China on the other side? I don't think so. Uh, the Chinese are not big on fighting. They're, they're not big on military involvement. Um, they have not won a single battle in, in, in the modern era. Um, they're not known as a military force. The Chinese focuses on commerce. Uh, the Russians, on the other hand, are um, quite fierce as far as... Uh, military matters go, and the Americans will do everything they can. The Europeans are just not even considered, but the Americans will do everything they can to avoid any sort of direct confrontation with, with Russia. And then, of course, there's Wagner, uh, whose uh, main function is to scare the wits out of everyone. They're basically uh, the, you know, the they're the monster in the closet that um, now Putin can pretend that he's the only one who controlled them, except that maybe he can't control them, Lukashenko can control them, except maybe the Lukashenko doesn't control them either. Um, so everybody gets to be very, very scared, and just the mere threat of Wagner showing up should be enough to prevent an armed conflict from breaking up. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, everybody is sort of slow walking the conflict. Uh, everybody's sort of saying the right things about Niger. And, oh, that this was a overthrow of a, a constitutionally elected president and please bring him back, except we're not going to lift a finger to make that happen because we're scared. And that's pretty much where it stands. Uh, I'd be surprised if there are any sudden moves there because nobody really has to gain much from uh, from causing a big armed conflict there. Um, 
everybody is eager to just basically wait it out and see what happens. Um, and everybody's sort of eager to watch France twisting in the wind, deprived of its uh, main source of uranium for its nuclear power program and uh, of its almost free gold that was being is being produced in Niger. And, and everybody is just going to watch France frantically try to do anything, but find itself unable to do anything at all. The main focus of China is, is the economy. But just yesterday, the Chinese defense minister said that China plans to expand military cooperation with SCO countries, Belarus and Iran. The problem in Taiwan is so real, it's so bold for China. How do you see that? I think both Belarus and Iran are um, really good for the Chinese military people to talk to and cooperate with. There's a lot for the, that they can, can learn. There's, there's, there are some technologies that they can uh, cherry pick. Uh, and they, they can also supply because the production capacity of, of China, Chinese industry, is just awesome. They can also uh, make plans to uh, resupply these militaries in case of an armed conflict. So that basically, chi what, can, what China can provide to countries within SCO is an infinitely huge rear. You know, Hitler was defeated because Germany didn't have much of a rear. Uh, it, it didn't have energy. It had limited industrial capacity. And it couldn't have produce Siberia, uh, whereas Russia had all of Siberia that was just churning out tanks and howitzers and and everything else faster than than anybody else in the world possibly could. Well, China is basically you know Soviet defense industry times ten, um, and if China uh, decides to 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 basically to resupply some military, then that military becomes fearless. It knows that it it can't lose, so it, it starts with a thousand tanks, and 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 NATO or whoever blows them up. Well, here come the Chinese with a thousand more tanks next week, and that can continue forever. So that is that is why China is probably getting involved in, in, in these relationships. Again, China is all about trade. It's not about fighting. They're, they're traders, they're not fighters. And as far as Taiwan, everything is going China's way anyway. You know, Guomindang, which is the reason Taiwan uh, chose independence from the mainland if Guomindang gets, gets elected, and it's in favor of uh, Taiwan rejoining the continent then it's pretty much game over for the West. It it no longer it can no longer drive a wedge between the two if they voluntarily unite. And and so China is willing to wait that out. I would say, uh, of course, it has to act strong because who wants to negotiate with someone who is weak? Um, so they they basically. You know, they, they, they get involved in all sorts of military maneuvers, joint military maneuvers with Russia next to Alaska, things like that, um, to make themselves look strong. And that's important. But looking strong and go out, going out and picking a fight are two very different things. Stephen Quatre, deputy of the Bundestag from the Alternative for Germany faction, he stated that there is no alternative to Russian gas. If that's the case, why there is no big movement inside Germany against this war? You don't see that. Uh, the Germans aren't allowed. The Germans aren't really in control of their own country. They're an occupied country. Their, their media has been infested by the CIA since World War II, practically, since there has been a CIA to infest it. Uh, their brains have been very well twisted uh, in a particular direction. 
the fact that AFD is now gaining a, a, a sizable minority is a sign that the Germans are finally waking up. Another sign that the Germans are waking up is that the waiting list for people who want to go from Germany to Russia, you know, there's a big, there are a few million people who are both both Russian and German. Uh, the so so-called Volga Deutsch are big contingent. These people have lived in Russia. They're basically Russian, except that they speak German. And when things were falling apart in Russia in the 90s, they all went to Germany and were received because they're hardworking and disciplined. And, you know, they went to work doing various things. Well, now they all want to go back to Russia. So that's a, a telltale sign that, you know, the, the Germans are waking up, realizing what's going on, realizing what's going to happen and trying to do something about it. Now, as far as gas, to, to return to the first part of your question, yes, there is no alternative to Russian gas. Germany has not been able to replace somewhere between a quarter and a third of the natural gas it needs. It's shutting down industry as a result of that. Um, and and it's losing jobs, and, and it's deindustrializing. And the only way to stop that is to restore the flow of natural gas from Russia. Do you think, are we going to have a political change inside Germany? Well, eventually, but I think first there has to be some political change in the United States. As I said, Germany is not really in charge of its own destiny yet. Yeah, political change in, in, in the United States. We have uh, RFK Jr., he gave an interview to Tucker Carlson in which he said the USA to Ukraine has already reached $130 billion with B. As millions of Americans remain without health care or food stamps. Why, when it comes to wars, these endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, now in Ukraine, they're ready to spend as much as possible. But when it comes to social issues like health care, it seems that they don't care at all. Uh, that's because they don't care at all. And the reason for that is obvious. All of these people who rely on government aid for this and that, from the point of view of the people in government, they're deadbeats. They're worthless. They might as well all die. And uh, they'll get replaced with, uh, you know, people from Latin America or something. They, they just don't matter. Uh, there's There are no kickbacks from social spending. You know, you spend money on, on food stamps. So how are the officials in Washington going to uh, be uh, secretly reimbursed for their effort? Where Where is the corruption in food stamps? You know, it's it's all relatively transparent, and the corruption that exists is really low level. It's people who uh, have more food stamps than they ought to, and they make some money by selling candy bars on the corner to bums. You know that that's pretty much the level of corruption in food stamps. Nothing major, but the level of corruption in weapons being sent to the Ukraine is fantastic. The kickbacks are tremendous. Uh, and the fact is that this is, first of all, these, these weapons, they can't be reordered until they're used up. And the Ukraine is wonderful in terms of uh, using up obsolete useless weapons, which opens up uh, the possibility of reordering more, in which case there'll be massive kickbacks to the people doing the reordering from uh, through the through the lo various lobbies and uh, through through campaign contributions from uh, from the employees of of weapons manufacturers, all of the all of that uh, all of the logistics for that corruption have been has been has been worked out in great detail and and works beautifully. So that's that's really if you, if you want to look at why the U.S. does things. Uh, look for um, how that corruption gets back to Washington and what the, the volume of corruption is 
and and you'll you'll find that that's that's the key to to unlocking the puzzle. You know, for instance, why why was the United States in Afghanistan for so, for such a long time? Well, as soon as they went in, uh, poppy growing and heroin production increased, and it became a giant profit center. And and as soon as as Americans left Afghanistan poppy cultivation collapsed, and now poor Americans have to uh, take fentanyl instead of heroin. Um, and the Chinese and the Mexicans are getting all the benefit from that. So that is suddenly a problem. Uh, same thing here. Um, you know, what's the use of giving health care to people that the, the officials in Washington would prefer to die? What, from their point of view, that's a useless, useless waste of money. We know that from what Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Sachs said, that when he went after the coup in Ukraine, when he went there, he was talking with some NGOs and American NGOs, and they were talking about how they manipulated the, the policies in Ukraine in order to facilitate the coup in Ukraine. And we in this in this interview RFK Jr. gave to Tucker Carlson, he mentions that U.S. intelligence agencies founded the 213-14 Maidan protest. They found it to the tune of five billion dollars. I never heard these details before. How, how do you see this? Well, the the five billion dollar number was thrown out thrown around by um, by Victoria Newland. Um, you know, she bragged that we we invested uh, five billion dollars in the in the Ukrainian political system. Uh, of course, what what that money did was corrupt uh, the system to a point where nobody went out to demonstrate unless they got paid, and uh, they got paid uh, for for a single demonstration. Uh, they got paid as much as most people made in a month. So after a while, the only lucrative business in the Ukraine was going out and protesting political demonstrations, and it built up from there. So basically, an entire nation was turned into a bunch of puppets that were relatively cheap. Um, and that's that's how the U.S. did it. That's how uh, the coup was brought about. When this war started, everyone was talking about what they're thinking of, because Ukraine cannot defeat Russia. But they went with this plan in, in Ukraine. Now Ukraine is has huge problems, considering economy, considering human resources. And they are still insisting on continuation of this war. In your opinion, what was the first goal? the main goal, the end game before this war, and what is what is it now? Well, the, the, the concept of it was that uh, the Russians would refuse to go to war against their fellow Russians, because from the Russian point of view, the Ukrainians are just, a, you know, they're basically Russian. You know, the Ukraine is a Russian-speaking country. You know, Kiev was a Russian-speaking city. Um, in spite of all this effort to in introduce Ukrainian, to Ukrainianize the place, most of the people there are kind of faking it. They don't really speak the language very well because their native language is Russia. So from the point of view of Russia, you know, here, here is a, a conflict being provoked uh, against their fellow Russians. And the idea was that the Russians would refuse to fight. In fact, the Russians uh, picked a strategy that was basically kind of a go slow strategy. You know, first they they kind of like took took a took a walk through the Ukraine. Some people greeted them with open arms, but they ran into some armed opposition. And the government in Kiev didn't seem too eager to surrender, but they did want to negotiate. So the Russians signed a deal with them and as a, a sign of good faith withdrew from, from the Kiev region. 
And then as soon as they did that, uh, the war was back on. So it turned out that the government in Kiev wasn't, you know, not able to negotiate on its own behalf. So Russia said, okay, no, we're not going to negotiate and we're only going to hit military targets. Of course, the Ukrainian side with tutelage from uh, from the, the Pentagon was trying to hit as many Russian civilians as possible, you know, just to upset the Russians, just to, to rile them up. Uh, but that didn't work out so well either because the Russians are just infinitely patient people and they just basically took it and did their best. And uh, until, until a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little over a week ago, the Russians would only strike military targets. They would not strike dual use targets such as civilian airports being used for military aircraft, such as civilian fuel depots being being used to, to fuel tanks, uh, such as railroads, civilian railroads being used to, to move military material, uh, uh, railroads, bridges, tunnels, et cetera, ports, uh, ports that were used to transport grain out and were also being used to transport weapons in. The Russians re resisted hitting them. But now something has changed. Now that the West has decided to give the Ukrainians long range weapons, of course, the Ukrainians don't know how to fire them, so those come along with Western crews. So the goal there is to start hitting Russia deep inside Russian territory. And then something snapped, and now the Russians are going ahead and destroying all of this uh, Ukrainian dual-use infrastructure. So from now from now on, it doesn't matter how how much weapons and and munitions uh, are donated or given to the Ukrainians. They won't reach the, the front lines. They will be destroyed on the way there, or they'll get stranded somewhere on the way or outside the Ukraine. So that is a major major change. Basically, uh, uh, the switch has been made from destroying the Ukrainian military to, to destroying the Ukrainian infra infrastructure that can be used by that military. Big change. You think that the reason for this continuation of war in Ukraine, it's merely a political move on the part of the United States? Well, yes, they, they can't really admit defeat and go home. Not, not after Afghanistan. Uh, basically, that would tell the world that America is finished on the world stage. They can't really afford to do that. And they're making money from it. You know, they can't, it's, it's going so well from that point of view. You know, the fact that the Ukraine is losing, that all of these Ukrainians are getting killed, that doesn't matter to Washington. What matters to Washington is that they're using up uh, their their obsolete war material. All of those old Bradleys, all of those, uh, you know, if they had Sherman tanks, they would send those. They're afraid to send the Ab Abrams tank because that's all they have, and because those would be like you know cows on ice on on Ukrainian land. They're not. They're designed for the desert. They're not designed for for swampy farmland. Um, but basically, they're just using up all of that war material, and the Ukrainians are basically being used as a as some kind of a lubricant. Uh, it doesn't matter how many of them die. So from from that point of view, uh, the the Americans are seeing this as a success. They're getting huge bribes, huge kickbacks. Uh, the the uh, the most lucrative part of the the spending that they do in Washington is defense spending. That's how that's why it's so huge, and social spending is you know uh, treated as some something something of you know it's grandfathered in. So they can't get rid of of social security, for example. They've already bankrupted it, but now they they can just sit there and wait. And, and uh, eventually it'll blow up 
and, and stop functioning, but they're afraid to touch it because that's a, a political time bomb, if you will. Uh, but, you know, defense spending is, is lucrative. It's, it's where they make their money. After Germany's recession, now recession came to Netherlands. It seems that it, down the road, we have all these European countries. Do you see any change in Europe happening soon? Well, at some point, something has to give, but I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, I, think that, I think that Europe can go through an extended period of turmoil. Look at France. They've been protesting for years now. Has the government changed? No, it hasn't. Uh, so the same thing can happen in, in, in other places in Europe. Um, things can get progressively worse, but the pe people's interests are going to be ignored. Uh, and the people will pretty much just put up with it and um, try to be positive about it and, you know, try not to cry, you know, feel sorry for themselves. Um, and that will pretty much be the extent of it for a long time. At some point, there will be an explosion. I think that ultimately the explosion will come when all of the migrants that are in Europe, you know, all of the Algerians, all of the Turks in Germany, the, the, the Muslim population in general, decides that it has had enough of its government, this government, this joke of a government, and decides to install a caliphate. That will be interesting.